Welcome to the Native Seed Bowl activity. My name is Patrick Goggin. I work with the UW Extension Lakes team out of the College of Natural Resources at UW Stevens Point. And I am joined today by my two lovely nieces, Savannah and Lily Paul. Uh, Savannah and Lily Paul, would you please say hello to our folks out there? What? Hi. Hello. How old are you? We'll start with you, Savannah. Please tell us how old are you and what grade you're in. I'm 11 years old and I'm in sixth grade. Sixth grade. And Lily Pa, how old are you and what grade are you in? I'm 11 and I'm in fifth grade. Well, wonderful to have you guys here today. And so what we're up to is doing a demonstration video to show you guys how to make these wonderful native plant seed balls. And what we do with these seed balls is we plant those out in the environment to help wildlife, to help pollinators, and to help create clean water and wildlife habitat for critters. So Savannah and Lily are gonna help us by working through native seed ball creation. And we're gonna work with 11 plants here today. And as we get going, Lily and Savannah are gonna share some of the biology of these native plants. And the first plant we're gonna work with today is plant number one, which is Lily Paws. What is the name of our first plant, Lily? New England Aster. Yeah, and what color is New England Aster? Purple or pink. Yeah, so here we go. Here's our New England Aster with that beautiful butterfly on it. Okay, and how tall does it get? Four to five feet. Yeah, so it gets to be pretty tall. And how does uh, New England Aster provide habitat for critters? Um, New England Aster's fibrous roots hold soil in place. New England Aster supports many pollinators with food and cover like long tongued bees, bee flies, butterflies, and skippers. Cool. So it supports a lot of our pollinators. What other animals does New England Aster's help support? The leaves of New England Aster are eaten by white tailed deer, cotton tail rabbits, and wild turkeys. Wow, so it helps support some of our bird friends, some of our rabbit friends, some of our deer friends. All right, ladies, if you would find your big of New England aster seed and grab your big bowl and put about half your seed into the bowl, like so, just drop it in there. Oh yeah, all right, all right. Let me know when you're ready and we'll go on to our second plant. Looks like you're getting there. All right, Savannah has our second plant. What's the name of our second plant, Savannah? Blue grama grass. Yeah, it's one of our grasses, beautiful plant. And what color is blue grama grass? Green and blue. Yeah, well, there's where that blue name comes from. So it starts out green and then it turns into a blue color. How tall does it get? It only gets one foot tall. Yeah, so this is one of our shorter native grasses. What kind of good habitat does uh, blue grama grass give us? Blue grama grass is drought tolerant and does well in a variety of wide so of soils. And blue grama grass have a fibrous root system that can extend six feet into the ground anchoring the soil. Wow, so those roots go way down into the soil and fibrous means it's kind of like your hair. So those fibrous roots get down and really help hold that soil. And what animals does the blue grama grass help support? It provides cover for many animals in dry areas like sandy hillsides along the water. Yeah, so many animals will utilize this for cover and nesting material. All right, ladies, let's find our blue grama grass bag and dump about half that seed into the bowl, if you would. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go on to our third plant when you're ready. And that plant is Lily Paw has it. What is the name of our third plant, Lily? Blue Vervain. Yeah, this one's a real stunner. And what color is it? Blue. <laughs> Pretty easy. And how tall does it get? Four to five feet. Yeah, so this one gets a little taller too. And how does Blue Vervain provide habitat for us? Blue Vervain is good for the wetter parts of a rain garden. It can withstand flooding and short periods of standing water. Great plant for the edge of a pond, creek, wetland, or a low-lying location that is wet. So that river, Des Moines River by your house, would be a spot where we might see a plant like this growing. And what kind of critters does the uh, blue vervain help us with, Lily? 
songbirds eat the seeds, including the cardinal, swamp sparrow, field sparrow, song sparrow, and slated junco. So our songbirds really love the seeds that come with this plant. So if you can, please find your blue vervain bag, and we'll dump about half of that seed into our native plant seed bowl. All right. And when you're ready, we'll go on to plant number four, which Savannah has. What is the name of our fourth plant, Savannah? Common milkweed. Yeah. And what color is uh, common milkweed? Red, pink, and rose. And how tall does common milkweed get? Two to three feet. And what kind of habitat does it provide? Planting common milkweed helps counter or ongoing threats to our monarch butterfly populations, and it's a wonderful bee-friendly plant. Cool. And what other animals does it help support? Common milkweed is the favorite of many insects, including beetles, bumblebees, honeybees, longhorn bees, swallowtail butterflies, monarch butterflies, and skippers. So lots of pollinators are, are visited visit this common milkweed. So if there's one plant that we can think about to help critters, this one is it. So ladies, if you want to dig out your common milkweed bag and throw about half that seed into the mix here. Now some of those pods, there you go, some of those pods may need to be broken up a little bit, but that'll all just become good parts of the native seed. All right. So put about half that in there. And as you guys are doing that, you might see that it has that white fluffy puffiness. And basically what happens is the seed is on that puffiness like a parachute and it gets picked up by the wind and blown around such that that helps it find its way to its new home. All right, let's move on to our fifth plant. And that is your plant, Lily Paul. What is our fifth plant, please? Stiff goldenrod. Stiff goldenrod, yeah. And what color does this plant get? Yellow. Yeah, so look at that beautiful yellow that it provides us. Oh, stunning. And how tall does it get? Um, three to four feet. Yeah, so three to four feet tall. And what kinds of habitat does it provide us? The flowers attract many kinds of insects, including long-tongued bees, short-tongued bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, and beetles. Monarch butterflies love to visit the flowers of stiff goldenrod. Cool. And what other animals does it support, Lily? Um, great prairie chicken and eastern goldfinches eat the seeds of stiff goldenrod. It, it, its leaves are eaten by white-tailed deer, cotton-tailed rabbit, and muskrats. Yeah, so the, a muskrat's a wetland critter, so lots of different animals are hitting this plant and eating it, as well as the birds. So let's add it to the mix, ladies. If you want to find your stiff goldenrod and put about half that seed into your bowl, please. Yeah, it's rain and stiff golden rod. All right. Let me know when you're ready. It's really fluffy. Yeah, so you can see this one has those little white parachutes attached to the seed as well. And you can see they kind of float in the air and that's how they travel around and find their new home. All right, let's go on to our sixth plant. Savannah, if you would, what's the name of our sixth plant? Great Indian plantain. Yeah, and what color does the flower get? White. Yeah, so it's a white flower. Beautiful, this isn't quite open in the picture I'm showing you here, but it's a beautiful plant. And how tall does it get? Eight feet tall. Yeah, so this one gets even taller than me. So you wanna put this plant where um, it's got the elbow room to kind of do its thing. And how does it support habitat? Great Indian plantain has huge round leaves that provide good cover for wildlife. And Great Indian plantain normally is found in high quality wooded habitats, good for wooden, good for woodland edges. Yeah. In fact, the leaves on this plant can get as big as a table or as big as this bowl. I mean, they're gigantic. It's like they're from a tropical forest. And what animals does the Great Indian plantain support? Assorted bees, wasps, 
and flies are attracted to the pollen and nectar that this tall plant has on its flower heads. Yeah, so there's some tasty nectar in that white flower that the, uh, the pollinators love to get in there and sip on. All right, ladies, if you can find your great Indian plantain seed and put about half of that seed into your bowl, please. All right. So with a tall plant like this that gets to be eight feet, we got to be a little careful using this in rain gardens and small gardens, but in places where it has the room, this plant does really, really well. All right, I think we're ready for our seventh plant. Lily Paul, what is the name of our seventh plant? Sky Blue Aster. Yeah, check out this. And what color is it? Light blue or violet. Or kind of sky blue. <laughs> All right, how tall does it get? Um, two to three feet. Yeah, so a little shorter, this plant. And what kinds of uh, habitat does uh, our aster, our sky blue aster, provide? Sky blue aster can grow in many different types of soil as long as it is well drained. Sky blue aster attracts butterflies and other good insects, such as small bees, flies, small butterflies, skippers, and wasps. Wow, so lots of pollinators are supported through this plant. And uh, it looks like some other animals are also supported through Sky Blue Aster. What are those? Ruffed grouse, wild turkey, cottontail rabbit, and white-tailed deer eat the leaves, and tree sparrows and white-footed mice eat the seeds. Yeah, so a whole bunch of critters are using this plant. So I think it's a good one to add to the mix. So if you would, grab your Sky Blue Aster, and we'll put about half that seed into our bowl. All right. And I'm mixing mine a little as I go here, but uh, we'll be getting the soil in and mixing it soon enough. All right. Next up is number eight, Savannah. What is the name of our eighth plant, please? Grassleaf goldenrod. Yeah, this is a very common plant. And what color does this one get? Yellow. Yep, there's our yellow grassleaf goldenrod. And how tall? Two to three feet. Yeah, so a little shorter too. And what does grass leaf goldenrod help us with from a habitat point of view? Mountain mint has a long bloom that time, making it a great choice for those interested in feeding pollinators. And the root system spreads to a form of a small colony of plants. So I have a little typo there. So um, I should be saying grass leaf goldenrod, not mountain bit. That's my bad. And what kinds of uh, critters does the uh, grass leaf goldenrod uh, support? Grass leaf goldenrod attracts many insects to its flowers, including various bees, wasps, flies, small butterflies, and beetles. Yeah. So if you can, grab your grass leaf goldenrod bag and we'll put about half that seed into our bowl. And the reason we're only putting half the seed in today is these ladies are going to make another round of seed balls, hopefully with their class. And so they're gonna only use about half their seed today and save the other half for making seed balls with their class down the road. All right, very good. All right, three more to go here. We're on to, uh, looks like number nine. What is the name of our ninth plant, please, Lily? Rosen. Rosin weed, actually, rosin, okay? Uh, there's a chemical or, or, or gooiness within it that is like a rosin, and that's where that common name comes from. What color is the flower? Yellow. Yeah, this is a big, tall, sunflowery kind of plant. Um, in fact, how tall does rosin weed get? Three to five feet. Yes, very tall. And what kind of habitat does rosin weed provide us? The top root of rosin weed can extend as deep as 12 feet into the ground, helping to anchor the helping to anchor the soil and provide channels for water movement. Rosin weed is a wonderful choice for a native garden where you can where you have dry conditions. Yeah, so this plant does well in dry situations. It also has that 12 foot root structure that really goes down into the ground, helping create channels for water to be drained, as well as just creating all sorts of life for um, critters who live in the soil. What other animals does rosin weed help support? The seeds of rosin weed are eaten by American gold flinch, finches, I'm sorry. The pollen and nectar of the flowers on rosin weed attract honeybees, bumblebees, little carpenter bees, 
cuckoo bees, minor bees, and large leaf cutting bees. So a whole bunch of bees. In fact, we have over a hundred kinds of bees here in the Midwest. And so this is a plant that supports lots of different kinds of those bees. All right, if you would, and take a look at how big the seed is when you guys put this into the, um, the, um, the bowl here. If you, if you wanna take a look, folks, this stuff gets really, these seeds are really, really big good food for birds um and so let's get some of that in there good old rosin wheat number 10 looks like it's yours savannah what is the name of our 10th plant please showy tick tree quail yeah and what color is the flower nice and pink huh cool little flower and how tall does uh the showy tick foil uh tree foil get three to five feet Tell us, uh, how does showy tick trefoil provide habitat for us? Showy tick trefoil have a long bloom time, making it a great choice for those interested in feeding pollinators. And as a legume. Yeah, you know what a legume is? A pea or a bean is a legume. Go ahead. Showy tick trefoil adds nitrogen back to the, into the soil via its roots. Yeah, so this is a plant that helps put nitrogen back in the soil through its root structures. Pretty cool. All right, and what kind of animals does the showy tick trefoil support? The nectar, pollen, seeds, and leaves of showy tick trefoil appeal to a number of insects, bumblebees, sweat peas, small resin bees, leaf cutter bees, and butterflies, birds, bobwhite quail, wild turkey, and mammals, white-footed mouse, and woodland deer mouse. Yeah, so pollinators, a couple of different kinds of birds, grassland birds like the quail and turkey, and mammals like the mouse, uh, the mice we talked about. All right, if you want to grab your showy tick foil, before you put some of the seed in your bowl, though, of your showy tick foil, what I want you to do is take some of the seed out and just put it on your shirt. And what you'll see is there's little hooks on the seed itself and it's hard to get these seeds off your clothes once they get on there and that's part of where that common name comes from and why the plant does this well when a critter's coming around or a, uh, a deer or one of these other animals with fur that seed clings to the deer's fur and it gets moved around the prairie and starts new plants so it's a pretty cool attribute of this showy trick teeth this showy tick tree foil all right, I think we have one more plant for us to talk about, Lily Paw, and that's number 11, and that plant is? Big blue stem grass. Yeah, this one's also called turkey foot because the seed head looks like a turkey's foot. And what color is the big blue stem grass when it's in seed? Brown. Yes, and how tall does it get? Five to seven. Yes, this is a tall one. In fact, it even, they say it got taller than that, so much so that when guys on, gals were on horses, riding their horses through blue stem fields, you couldn't even see them on their horse that was so tall. Okay, and what kind of habitat does this big blue stem provide us? Big blue stem is the host to many insects, including northern curly eye, common wood nymph, auto skipper, cobweb cobweb skipper, dusted skipper, Delaware skipper, Aragos skipper, and Indian skipper. Good job. So those are all different kinds of little butterflies, or we call them skippers, that the uh, grass supports. What else? This grass provides nesting material, cover, and food for many grassland birds and small mammals. So this is a mainstay in our prairie ecosystem and a, a big important grass in the grassland system. Sounds good. What other animals does it support? Big blue stem is a, a well-known grassland staple where it plays an extremely important role in native prairie eco ecosystems it, and provides habitat for many insects, small mammals, and birds. All right, so I think this is a good one to add to the mix, don't you? So let's put our big blue stem in about half the bag. And we're back. All right. So we have our beautiful native seed all in our bowl. The next step is to go through the rest of the ingredients that go into our native seed ball um, activity. And so the first thing we need is 
um, some bentonite clay or other types of clay. And so you can usually find these at, at uh, hobby type stores. Uh, ceramic industry uses a lot of them. We need to be careful with this stuff because it can get a little airborne. But if you wanna carefully get that clay and spread it in there, there we go. It'll smell a little like clay in your, but that's okay. Okay, so the first ingredient was some of our clay. That's roughly five parts to one part of our native seed. You guys with me still? Looks like you're doing well, good. Next up, we're gonna add our, our compost. In this case, we're using some mushroom compost and we have three parts of that. So go ahead and dump your compost into your big bowl. And what I might have you do, ladies, with your gloves on after you get your compost in is just give it a, a mix of the dry ingredients. Be careful, that clay is going to try and get airborne on you. And just squeeze it. I'm just squeezing it with my hands, squeezing it, trying to move that seed around a little bit. All right. How you guys doing? Looks like you're having fun, getting messy. All right. I think we're ready for the water. So we'll start with about four cups of water or 32. Um, this, in this case, I have about 32 ounces here and I'm gonna use about half this to start with. So 16 ounces or so. And I don't know about you, but it looks like it's drinking this up pretty good. And I don't know about you, but mine's getting pretty, pretty nice and soggy, almost like cookie dough, right? How's yours going, ladies? <laughs> All right. I think um, basically the next step is to you can either use your hands like I'm going to do because I've made many a meatball. I'm just. Yeah, I think they're pretty pliable. I'm going to put the whole 32 ounces uh, in mine, though. There we go. So about four, four cups or so. And then basically you just wanna grab either using your ice cream scoop if you have one and wanna use it or like I'm doing just using my hands and basically create little meatball sized or golf ball sized. And basically if you roll them around a little in your palms and then you can use your cookie tray to set them on. So you see how we're doing this? You guys are doing great. You see how I'm just grabbing a chunk. So a chunk about this size as a golf ball, rolling it around a little, give it a little squeeze. And that clay binder pulls it right together. The idea it's big enough for a, a young kid to grab it and throw it to where we're gonna put it out in the environment. And what happens is all that seed gets brought in with the soil and the clay into this ball and we can throw those out in the environment in a place where someone wants some wildflowers to be growing and we're off and running with our native planting. You can also use an egg carton like this to store the seed balls in once you get them. So you can place them into the egg container and use that as a way to just store them in a fridge for a while if you want or out in a garage would be fine. Now you can plant these anytime, but if you plant them this time of year, one of the things that's good is they go through the thawing and freezing out there in the cold of mother nature. And that triggers the seed to germinate sometimes for these prairie plants. So you might think about putting the uh, seed balls out in the environment in snow and letting them fall down into the snow and work their way into the uh, soil that way. 
How's it going, ladies? You guys start? Oh, yeah, you're on your way, Savannah. How about you, Lily? How's it going? I'm going with my bare hands because the gloves are like, like it's so sticky that the gloves are just sliding off. You know, yeah. if I love to feel the soil in my hands, so I'm, I'm kind of with you. I like it to use my hands. Us good cooks, too, we like to get in there and get dirty. So basically... We're off and running here with a nice native planting of our 11 pollinator friendly plants. So do you guys have some ideas about where you might plant these going forward? Maybe like in our garden? Yeah. Um, the river um, next to my house? Yeah. So just make sure if you plant these on someone else's property that you get permission. So in the case of like your, the park by your house, that's probably owned by the city. You could just call up the city um, manager for those gardens and see if they wouldn't mind you throwing some of those in a particular area. But you need to work with um, whoever the owner of the land is to make sure you're getting permission. So if you have an aunt and uncle who own a farm, for example, that might be the perfect place to go and uh, throw some around, right, Savannah? The other thing you could do is um, just make a little area the size of uh, a picnic table, for example, and plant the balls right into the soil that way um, and not throwing them around, but being a little more purposeful with your planting. So that could work too. This is what we get. Um, so ours are a little darker because I use mushroom compost in this case, but you can see these will dry up then a little bit and we can put them into the, um, right into the egg container and be storing them for when we want to plant them. So Mickey and Lily Pod, sounds like you have a second uh, place you might be putting your seed. Where is that? Well, we have the Global Greens uh, Farm, which is a farming program that we run with the uh, Lutheran Services in Iowa. And they've got uh, an incubator farm here where they work with refugees and then a couple people, advanced farmers who've moved off site. So we'll, we'll throw this idea by them and hope they'll take advantage of it. So they grow vegetables as well as flowers and, and native habitat? That's right, they grow uh, a variety of vegetables uh, native to the US here in Iowa, but they also grow some very interesting vegetables from their home countries. Oh, sure. And uh, they're involved here at the uh, Des Moines Farmers Market as well as the LSI's Farmer Market. Cool, well, uh, hopefully they'll enjoy your native seed balls. So ladies, good job. Everyone got their balls created and I think, it's time for us to invite others maybe um, to please join us. Make some native seed balls today. Lily, you're saying, woo. Yeah, yeah. Join us. Native plant seed balls. Yeah, make some native plant seed balls. Woo! Yes. All right, Vinny, well done. Give yourselves a hand, Savannah and Lily. You guys did a great job. Thank you very much for helping be a part of our native seed ball activity.